Okay, welcome to lecture 1.4 of unit 2 on the topic of half-life. Here are the learning intention and success criteria for this chapter. Please pause the video and attempt to complete the knowledge and skills table. Alright, so hopefully looking through here, some of the knowledge that you should have identified is, well, we've got to know what a half-life is in the first place, uh, otherwise you can't explain it, you certainly can't define it. Uh, you should know what uh, and how to solve a nuclear decay problem. Uh, in terms of depth, this one is not a particularly um, uh, deep actual topic here, okay, so it's fairly straightforward. So, when talking about decay, uh, not all radioactive elements decay at the same rate. Uh, in fact, with some, even within a sample of a pure radioisotope, and not every atom will undergo nuclear decay at the same time. When we talk about nuclear decay or radioactive decay, it's what's considered a spontaneous event. So spontaneous means without external stimulus, it's something that occurs at random. Okay, so that means it's impossible to know which atoms will decay in a substance, but we will know that some or particular numbers will, of them will decay within a given time. Now, in class you did an activity where you simulated a group of objects decaying, um, in this case a small number, there's only 50. If you think about the counters, um, you started with 50 and after a shake, on average you should have had about 25 left. So we start with 50, we shake it, and now there are 25 left. I know it looks different, but I do believe me, there are 50 blue circles here, and here there were 25 blue and 25 white. Um, shake it again, you'll be down to about 12. 12.5, which is either going to round up to 12 or round, uh, sorry, round up to 13 or round down to 12. Uh, shake it again, 6, shake it again, 3, shake it again, probably 2 or 1. Okay, and eventually you keep shaking it, that last one will then vanish off. Okay, and what you were simulating there was called the half life. Okay? So when we define the word half life, the half life is the length of time it takes for half the nuclear mass to undergo a decay. Now I say nuclear mass there, um, in your definition this is directly taken from your textbook, sorry, from the syllabus, uh, say so half the atoms in a sample, uh, but there's, whether you say that it's half the atoms in terms of the six billion 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 atoms worth in one mole of matter, or you just say, well, there's one kilogram of it, how long does it take for half a kilogram of it to undergo decay? That is the half-life. Okay, it is a um, doesn't matter about the actual value of the mass you use. So after one half-life, okay, the mass or the number of the particles or even the activity, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit um, of the radioisotope. So how many particles are coming off per second will be half what it was at the start, and because of that keeps halving, we get that characteristic inverse exponential curve we saw in our class activity. Okay, so here's the image from the book. As you can see here that, well, we have a so number of N13, nitrogen 13 nuclei remaining, 10,000. Well, if it starts at 10,000, the half-life would have to be up when it gets to 5,000, which we can see there is 10 minutes. After 20 minutes, it has gone from half of that down to 2,500. After 10 minutes, half of that down to 12,050. Half of that, after 10 minutes, down to 600-something. And this would just keep petering out slowly, slowly, slowly. By convention, we would say it takes about 10 half-lives to become all expended or finished. Okay? And so in this case, well, this would be expended after about 100 minutes. And it wouldn't matter what our original value was. Okay? We could have started with 1 billion atoms. Then be half a billion, and then a quarter of a billion. But as you go down through 10 half-lives, it's going to hit a very, very low number pretty quickly. Alright, so there is a half formula that you're expected to be able to use. Okay, uh, n in this case, this little n, okay, is the number of half lives. Now, this n naught and n capital N, these are fairly important because n naught could be the number of atoms, in which case n will be a reference of the number of atoms. Uh, here I've said particles. You could do it in kilograms and it then would have some value in kilograms. You could also do it in an activity. So if it's saying that the activity is uh, 5,000 becquerels, which is 5,000 decays per second, then the ending would be in some value of becquerels. Uh, so these units will cancel off each other and then you've just got this n value for half-life. 
notice that n, is this case, uh, is the number of half lives. And we can work out the number of half lives. The textbook is saying, or the syllabus, sorry, is saying that you have to be able to work out half life uh, equations with whole number of half lives. So they're going to give you something like, um, you know, this substance has a half life of 10 minutes. How much of it will be left after 50 minutes? In which case you go, all right, well, if the half life is 10 minutes and the number of half lives is um, 50 minutes, well, I need to take the ratio of the two and I'd get the n in terms of well, how many half lives happened. But looking at that formula, that doesn't actually make any sense now to me. I just need to do that the textbook quickly. Um, so this thing here, if I actually use those numbers, I'm just going to work my way through this. If I use that as 10 over 50, then that would give me 0 0.5. Now, half of to the power of 0 0.5 is a fairly small number, which means that I wouldn't get very much decay here because I'm, I'm not even multiplying by half, I'm multiplying out of a half to the power of a half. Uh, let me find my physics textbook because I think possibly there's been a mistake. Either with me or with the textbook. Um, this should really be the other way around. Apologies, still looking for the right thing. Ah, yes, I have made a mistake. Okay, so the textbook does have this right. It should read n equals t over t a half, which makes a lot more sense. So 50 minutes divided by 10 would give us five half lives. So then you'd have a half to the power of five, then multiply by that. So this formula is incorrect. Um, the one in the textbook does have t over t a half. Uh, I'm not sure what I was looking at to get this around the wrong way. Okay, so. Uh, you, you should be able to work out um, the number of half-lives from first principles or use that equation. This, this thing here though doesn't appear in your formula sheet. This one does, but this won't. So you can kind of expect to have to do this by first principles, where if you're told you know, it goes for 40 minutes and the half-life is 20 minutes, then you go, all right, well, that's two half-lives. Uh, after 20 minutes, it'll be half, and after 20 minutes, it'll be half again. Yeah. Let's have a look at a couple of examples in the text here. So, first one here has uh, iodine 131 has a half-life of eight days and undergoes beta negative decay according to the equation above. Uh, if a milk sample contains 3 times 10 to the 18 atoms at a particular time, calculate the number of atoms present after. Duh, duh, duh. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Uh, we know that n naught is equal to 3 times 10 to the 18. Okay. By the half-life uh, equation, then we know that n will equal n naught times a half to the power of n. So this first one, five half-lives, well, n is going to equal to five. So three times 10 to the 18 times a half to the power of five, and that will equal n. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to halve it, then we're going to halve it again, then we're going to halve again. So I'll, I'll do it by a couple of different ways. So if I do 3 times 10 to the 18, and I halve it, 1 half gives me 1.5 times 10 to the 18, halve it again, 7.5 times 10 to the 17, 3, 4, 5. So if I just do it that way, where I divide by half 5 times, I end up with uh, 9 point, I'll round it off, 9.4 times 10 to the 16. Okay. If instead I actually put the whole formula in, 3 times 10 to the 18 times uh, 0.5 to the power of 5 gives me the exact same answer. So you can use the formula or you can kind of do it by first principles. Let's have a look at this next one. 60 days. So 60 days there, well, we now actually need to know how many ends this is. I would say that this type of question is very much like what the final exam would have uh, distributed by QCAA. In terms of the 60 day ones, well, um, we could work out how many half life 60 days is uh, using the previous formula. But if you do 60 divided by 8, you get 7.5 half lives. Oops, half lives, not lives. 
Now that's not a whole number of half lives, which is not in the syllabus. So we're going to do this anyway, but you need to be aware that sometimes the, I think for this, um, the text is a little bit more wanting to go a bit further because it's what we've done in the previous syllabus. But now that we've got that, we can plug that into it. Note though that I can't do 7.5 halves very easily. I'd have to actually do 7.5, sorry, a half to the power of 7.5. So n equals 3 times 10 to the 18 times a half to the power of 7.5. 3 10 to the 18 times 0.5 to the power of 7.5 gives me 1.6, uh, yeah, 1.6 will do, times 10 to the 16. Okay, um, the last one there, two years. Going, well, our half life is in eight days, in days, so we're gonna have to turn two years into days. So 365 times two gives us 730 divided by eight. So n would equal 730 divided by eight equals 91.25. So again, we do the exact same thing n equals 3 times 10 to the 18 times a half to the power of 91.25 3 10 to the 18 times 0.5 to the power of 91.25 gives us uh, a very small number which is 1 times 10 to the negative 9. Now the textbook says in response to this that, well this is less than 1 so obviously it would have expired well, well, well before that. Yes and no. Right. This is a probabilistic event. The likelihood that there's still an atom left would be exceptionally low, but there's still a chance an atom could be left. Um, these things do not care about what has happened in the past. So let's say we had just one atom left. After eight days, there would be a fairly good chance, a 50-50 chance essentially, that one of the, that, that atom would decay, because th that's the half-life. But after 16 days, it hasn't increased the chance that that one would decay. Every day, or every second, it has the same equal chance to decay. And if it hasn't decayed in the past, that doesn't increase the chance in the present. Probability is weird like that. Okay, so you've got to be real careful with um, taking things like this and going, oh yeah, the number's less than one, so it's definitely would have decayed. No, it hasn't definitely decayed. It's most probably decayed, but there is a small yet non-zero chance that it hasn't. And that's probably more the mathematician than me being pedantic, but it is what it is. Okay, um, still working with ID 131 for this other example here. This is the other style of question you can get. Um, ID 131, half-life of 8 days, sample has the same number, so let's write that down, n, oops, n equals 3 times 10 to the 18, sorry, n0, uh, n t half equals 8 days. <coughs> um, calculate the time that would have elapsed for there to be 1 million atoms of iodine left. I don't think this sort of question is what you would get on an exam because this number 1 million 1 times 10 to the 16 sorry 10 to the 6 is significantly far away in terms of um, half-lives <coughs> excuse me uh, if they said well 3 times 10 to the 18 uh, how many ha and then you know how much time has passed to get to 1.5 times 10 to the 18 or even um, 7.5 times 10 to the 17 there's a reasonable chance you could figure out that, oh, that's only a couple, if I divide by two a couple of times, oh, it's happened twice, therefore it's two half-lives or 16 days. Um, this sort of question seems a little bit too you know, extreme in terms of the working out. So I will go through it, but um, I don't think you'll get anything this complicated in terms of needing to deal with logarithms. So, let's plug it into the formula. We have that 1 times 10 to the 6 equals 3 times 10 to the 18 times a half to the power of n. And we don't know what n is. So, let's firstly work out what n is and then we'll worry about working out what time in terms of uh, days is equal to. The way we rearrange it, this, we can divide this number over. So we're going to have 1 times 10 to the 6 divided by 3 times 10 to the 18. Uh, which is going to be 1 over 3 times 10 to the negative 12 uh, or 
point no, yeah, let's just leave it as 1 over 3 1 over 3 times 10 to the negative 12 for the moment equals a half to the power of n now the way to solve this is using what we call a logarithm now a logarithm uh, on your calculator if you've got a scientific calculator you'll see two buttons one will be called log and one will be called ln now in this case it doesn't matter which you use they will give you the right answer regardless but you will get different numbers as you go through I'm going to use log because log deals with um, power of base 10 okay? um, you can use ln because that's power of base e so if you're using it for exponential functions sometimes ln can help if you've got an e in there because then it'll can you'll get an ln of e and they'll cancel to one which is um, gets rid of some funky stuff so log is like a transformation if I do it to one side I can do it to the other side and it will still be a true equation it equals log of a half to the power of n the special property about logs though is big when I have log of something to the power of something that power gets to jump out the front uh, log of something this here that's just a number okay you chuck them you calculate it, you'll get a number so now I have log of 1 over 3 times 10 to the negative 12 equals n times log of 1 over 2 we can rearrange that n will equal log 1 over 3 times 10 to the negative 12 over log of 1 over 2 alright check that in now uh, log of 1 over 3 actually let's do this times 10 to the negative 12 take the log of that gives me n equals negative 12.48 divided by so if you put that top line into calculator that's the answer you get log of a half negative 0 0.301 0.48 divided by 0.301 n equals 41.5 approximately so 41.5 half lives uh, we know one half life is equal to 8 days so 41.5 times 8 so t equals 41.5 times 8 equals 332 days or quite close to one year now as I said that seems a fairly hefty type of problem um, if instead I gave you something like well there are 6,000 particles uh, and after a period of time there was 750 particles what's the half-life or how many days have passed and if the half-life is equal to this how many days have passed something like that and you go well 6,000 you know if I divide by 2 a few times I will get to 1,500 um, after divide by 2 twice or I'll get to 750 after divide by 2 three times it would be something that is going to be a fairly straightforward easy connection of numbers in my opinion not something you have to deal with logs to get partial half-lives so I think honestly this problem is a bit beyond the scope of the syllabus but I wanted to go through it anyway now the last thing is the idea of activity. Now chapter 5.6 has some good information about activity. It is not in the syllabus, it is extracurricular. You won't need it for your exam. It may help as a bit of research for your assignment, especially if you do anything that involves activity, stuff like uh, radiometrics or anything to do with um, medical treatment of, uh, involving radiation because activity is fairly important there. Okay. There is a fairly important concept that I wanted to clarify though is that the activity of a substance is proportional to the mass of the substance and what I mean by this is that the bigger something is the more activity it will have so if you have a small mass with a very high activity um, that can be very very dangerous in terms of how much radiation is coming off to it and something with a very big mass but that has a low activity okay so activity is something that is worthwhile reading about if you are looking at anything for your research question that deals with this topic okay. So, in this lesson we've gone through a couple of things, uh, we've explained what half-life is, and we've done two types of calculations, we've calculated the remaining particles after a period of time, we've calculated the time to get to a particular particle count. Those are really the only two questions that can involve half-life. Yeah. 
Uh, for class, uh, please download chapter 5.5 .5 of the or check your learning PDF and complete questions 1 to 6 uh, from chapter 5.5. .5. Uh, please copy it into the space on 2.1.4 on eLearn. All right. Thanks very much for listening, guys. Have a great evening.